If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 24. We'll be looking at verse 14 together today. And we'll set the context by beginning our reading in Matthew 24, verse 1. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. And then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Jesus has never been impressed with our buildings. He's more impressed with how many we send than by how many we seat. And when shown this edifice, he kind of shrugs because he knows it's all going to come down. And in reference to Jewish apocalyptic eschatology, his disciples understand when he says it's all going to be thrown down, it's referring to the signs of the end of the times. And so they ask him in verse 3, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. And Jesus then in the next few verses up through verse 13 gives a litany of signs how when these things have been accomplished, we know that he will come back. Now, if we look at them, we can make a case historically that all of them through verse 13 have happened. Verse 4, many claiming to be false Christs. Verse 6, wars and rumors of wars. Verse 7, nation rising against nation. Verse 8, famines, pestilences, earthquakes. Verse 9, suffering martyrdoms, being hated for Jesus' sake. Historians tell us that 70 million Christians have been killed since Jesus said those words. Verse 10, many offended, brain, betraying and hating one another. Verse 11, false prophets and much deceit. That happens even now, the prosperity doctrine, just one very obvious example. Verse 12, lawlessness and perversity abounding. How many despicable evils are sanctioned by law even in this nation as we speak? And the love of many has grown cowardly, confused, and cold. And then verse 13, endurance through all the above terrors is itself a sign. If we haven't yet gone through unimaginable things, we're not quite at the end. And even if that's not true here in America, it will be shortly, shortly and it has been true in other places of the world where men and women have gone through unimaginable suffering because of the name of Christ. So you can make a case that all those things have happened in history. All of them except what we find in verse 14. And we're going to take verse 14 phrase by phrase this morning. It simply says this, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So let's take that phrase by phrase this morning. First of all, this gospel. If we were going to summarize the gospel according to 1 Corinthians 15 as Paul did, we would say Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again on the third day. That is beautiful. It's pithy. But Paul wrote that decades after Jesus said this gospel. And Jesus appeared, Mark chapter 1, preaching this gospel. Galatians chapter 3, it says the gospel was preached to Abraham. In Romans chapter 1, it says the gospel of God was promised through the Holy Scriptures. And so if we're going to define the gospel in the way that Jesus understood it when he first preached, when he mandated that the gospel would go forth to all the world, what is that gospel? And how would you explain the gospel to me if you couldn't say anything from the New Testament. If you couldn't say Jesus, if you couldn't say cross, if you couldn't say the resurrection or anything churchy, how then would you describe the gospel? What was the gospel that was preached to Abraham? What was the gospel that all of the scriptures foretold? Well, the word gospel means good news, and in order for news to be good, there needs to be some context of bad news. So perhaps the real question is, what's the bad news that makes the good news so sweet? 
I think the character of God described in the Old Testament so faithfully is that he is merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in love. And the very fact that it says that God is slow to anger means that he gets angry. There are some things in the holy nature of God that so upset him that he, by nature, must destroy those things. And the bad news is that because of our incessant and disgusting sin and rebellion, the whole world, the Bible tells us, is under the wrath of a holy God. And God's holiness demands that he will purge the earth of what is vile. How do you think God feels about divorce? How do you think God feels about child pornography? How do you think God feels about the trafficking that we just saw and heard those ugly statistics? Should those things not be destroyed? Should we continue with child pornography on into the millennium? Or is there something about the righteous nature of God that must destroy that which is wicked? And I think all of us would recognize we have feelings of injustice. There are things that get us emotional. There are things that we would want to destroy because even in our fallenness, we know that they are vile. How much more for a holy and precious and pure divine creator should he not by nature destroy that which is ugly, which is wicked, which is vile? And we can say, oh yeah, let him destroy all those bad guys out there. But the reality is, what about when it's in your heart? What about when the sin and the wickedness is in us? Because none of us are pure and none of us can earn by merit a reprieve from the wrath of God. Therefore, if that's the bad news, that the whole world is under the wrath of a holy God, then the good news, the gospel that Jesus preached in love, is that God saves us from God. For God. God saves us from God for God. That's why the old hymn say, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. Be of sin the double cure, save from wrath and make me pure. Till on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. This is the book of Romans. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than having been justified by his blood. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. This is the essential nature of the gospel. Let me make a case for it from the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 11, God says, I'll bring one more plague on Pharaoh and Egypt. Midnight, I will go through the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn of the, of the Egyptians shall die. In chapter 12, he says, I will pass through the land of Egypt. I will strike all the firstborn. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague will not be on you to destroy when I strike the land of Egypt. The Bible is shockingly clear. The people were not safe from Pharaoh. The people were not safe from Pharaoh's soldiers. The people were not even safe from sin. Those that were under the blood were saved from the wrath of God. The Israelites were saved from God by God this is the heart of the gospel. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't primarily save us from the devil. He didn't primarily save us from sin, but from the effects of sin, if you'll understand it theologically, because it's not your lying or your stealing or your committing adultery that c kills you and you drop dead immediately after you commit that sin. What is it that kills you? What is it that consigns you to eternal hell? It is the judgment of a holy and righteous God on that sin. So the gospel is that the love of God saves us from the wrath of God for the joys of God. Now that can be difficult didactically, so let me use narrative to tell the same story. There was an African king, he had a problem in his kingdom, a chicken thief was running wild, so he decreed that when the chicken thief was caught, they would whip that thief with 10 strokes of a whip that had iron laced into it to lacerate the back, 
but chickens were still stolen, so the king said, now, bigger problem when we catch the thief, 50 lashes of the whip, more chickens were pilfered. So feeling mocked, the king said, 75 lashes will be the punishment, more chickens were lost, and full of wrath, the king said, when we catch that thief, we will beat them with a hundred lashes of that whip. A punishment so severe, maybe even the strongest man couldn't survive it. And then they found the thief. And to the shock and the dismay of all, not least the king, that chicken thief was the king's mother. And so the kingdom was stunned. What would the king do? Would he uphold judgment and scorn mercy? Would he be merciful? make a mockery of justice. It's called in theology the divine dilemma. The day of reckoning came. The king sat sternly on the throne. The chicken thief was brought before him. Tie the thief to the whipping post, he said quietly. Give her all 100 strokes of that whip. And if you refrain, you do so at the cost of your own life. The crowd was astonished as the thief, the king's mother, was tied to that stake. One more thing the king commanded softly. And he stood, and he removed his royal robe, and he descended from the throne. And he went up to his mother, and he wrapped his arms around her, shielded her body completely. He looked at the executioners as he held on to his mother and held her tight, and he said, now, beat the thief. And the king took his own punishment and absorbed the beating of his mother. And that's the gospel that the king of all glory stepped off his heavenly throne and he came down into the muck and mire of our existence, knowing everything that we'd done, knowing the heavenly decrees and the eternal laws, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And on the cross, Jesus wrapped his arms around us and he said to the Father, now beat the thief because the love of God saves us from the wrath of God for the joys of God. This gospel is the gospel of the kingdom because there is no salvation without the king coming off the throne to save. And that is why the deity of Jesus is under such assault all around the world, even in secular humanist America, because we can worship Jesus as a philosopher, as a moral teacher, but we aren't allowed to consider him as God. But if Jesus is not God, there is no gospel, there is no redemption, there is no swallowing of the wrath of God. The gospel demands that the king comes off his throne and absorbs that wrath for you and for me. And how will we respond to that king? And how our king is mocked and scorned in our age? And how even we, the people of God, do not fall in reverence at his feet? And how cavalier we are, whether in his sanctuary or in our homes, with the junk and vile we bring in our phones or bring through our televisions or in our conversations. And we've lost that holy, sacred sense that the king walks amongst us and he came down into the muck and mire of our life so that God would save us from God. I hope you never lose a sense of reverence for the king. I hope somehow in your own way you do something like my mother who begins every morning by approaching the king, taking in her prayer my two sons in each of her hands and in the spirit of that prayer she marches them to the throne of grace. And there my almost 80 year old mother, retired missionary, 47 years on the field, She's never forgotten who the king is and she bows in that prayer and leads her grandsons to bow before the king because she's never forgotten. There's one king. He has all the authority. He has all the rights. We have none. It is his to command. It is ours to obey. And what joy and delight and fulfillment there is in saying, yes, Lord, whatever you want, wherever you'll send, whatever is required, whatever is the price, I am happy happy to bow because in that bowing is my greatest joy. We must never forget that the gospel is the gospel of the king. And the gospel, the kingdom, will be preached. 
We don't like that verb anymore, preaching. It's not popular. It can open us up to charges of hypocrisy. And yet, 1 Corinthians, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believed. Preaching fixes the efficacy solely on what God has done. Preaching removes any doubt where the hope or the power is sourced. It's not in projects. It's not in dollars. It's not in programs. It's not in me. It's not in you. God, through Christ, is the power of the gospel, and faith still comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And the weakness of God is still stronger than men, and the foolishness of God is still wiser than men. And to be clear, preaching is not confined to what I'm doing now behind this wooden pulpit, no. It is the verbal proclamation of all of God's people everywhere, in the marketplace and in the living room and in the cafes, in the restaurants, in the buses, in the parks. It's in every medium. It's through dance. It's through art. It's through music. It's through video. It is incumbent on every person of every age that we open up our mouths and we talk about Jesus because our role biblically is so crystal clear. We were told we were watchmen. We are town criers. We are heralds. We are messengers. We are voices crying in the wilderness. And this is why spirit filling in the Holy Scriptures always affects the tongue. It always affects the mouth. Whether that was in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, Zacharias, Mary, Elizabeth, John, Jesus, Peter, Philip, Paul, Pentecost, it didn't matter because what happened was when Jesus becomes so real to us, that fire of heaven, it's kindled within and we become so enraptured with Jesus, we can't contain him. It's like a fire within our bones and we must open up our mouths and vent to the world the glories of the majesty within. And that fire and that passion and that zeal, it's not of us. We've just in encountered Jesus. We have come face to face in intimacy with God Most High, and this vessel of clay cannot contain transcendent God if the God of creation and the God of glory and the God of all might and the God of all wisdom and the God of all power deigns to descend and condescend to be with me and reveal himself to me. How can this little vessel of clay contain that? I have to open up my mouth and talk about Jesus. And if we're having trouble talking about Jesus, it just means we haven't really met him yet. How can we meet Jesus in all of his glory, in all of his wonder, and stay quiet about that when we run our mouths about every other foolish thing? And yet the wonderful, precious Savior, when he becomes known to us, how can we not share that? How can we not open our mouths and talk about him? We say with Jesus in Luke, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach. And I must preach in other cities for that reason I've been sent. And we say with Paul, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Because the gospel of the kingdom must be preached. And any obedience comes with the price tag. Our assignment as missionaries is to verbally transmit the gospel in the heart language of the people, to be friendly and faithful, to be ready in season and out to contextually present these eternal truths. But we've learned along the way that when we drill wells or when we build schools or when we help those who are hungry or when we feed the naked, we are loved. But when we open up our mouths and preach the gospel, we are hated and expelled. Social ministries make you loved. Preaching makes you hated. In our context, even of Matthew 24, verse 9, Jesus tells us we're going to be hated, not loved. Why are we, as the people of God in this world, trying so hard to be loved when Jesus told us over and over again we're going to be hated? You see, if you think that your goal is to be universally loved, you have not understood the gospel. The gospel. 
or its consequences, or what happened to Jesus himself, or the very nature of love. Because the most loving thing that we can do is open up our mouths and talk about Jesus to preach the gospel. And herein is the dilemma. Because all the forces of our context and our culture today are demanding that we shut up. And so tomorrow morning with your family or in your own private time, when you approach the throne of grace and the world is commanding you to be silent and the king is commanding you to preach, to whom are you going to bow? For the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world to all the nations. That word nations in the text, it's the word ethne, it's where we get our word ethnic. And what the Bible clearly points out is that it's not just a country that should receive the gospel, but every people group that has their own language and their own religion and their own culture, every subset needs its own presentation of the gospel. And so in the world today, there's still more than 7,000 unreached people groups, nations of the Bible that have never had a church or a Christian, never even known the gospel or heard it, that's 3.15 billion people. That's 42% of the world. And we understand that they're lost here in Des Moines on our university campuses and in our suburbs. We understand that there's work to do. We understand that Des Moines part of the world. But the assertion of this text is not that the near is being neglected, but that the far is at a disadvantage. I stopped counting how many churches as I was driven to church here today. There are Christians, there are bookstores, there are conferences, there are youth groups, there are books. There's all kinds of opportunity here in Des Moines if someone wants to hear about Jesus. Lift your hand if you come from a family of two children or more. Can I just see your hand? Two more children. Let's say two of those children, whether they're your own or your siblings, let's say they were here today and both of them somehow wandered out of children's church and got lost and one of them wandered out in the foyer and was lost from their mom and dad. But one of them, I see a bus out those doors right now, somehow got on that bus and got downtown and got on a Greyhound and went to New York and got on a boat and went off to China and got on a train and somehow that little seven-year-old, ridiculous as it sounds, ended up in the middle of China. Now, you have two children, you love them equally, one of them's lost wandering around in the foyer and one of them's out in the mountains of China. And let's say Bill Gates heard about it and he said, man, I gotta help find those two lost children, equally lost, but here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you guys a billion dollars. And then pastor says, you know what? We're gonna take $970 million and we're gonna look for that kid that's lost in the foyer and we're gonna take 3% of that billion and look for the kid that's lost in China. How would you feel about that? Equally lost, but not equally having access to being found. But that is what the church, that's exactly what the church is doing today. Because 97% of all of our missions giving and our missionaries are out in the foyer looking for lost kids. They're in Christian countries where there's strong Christian churches walking around looking for those who are legitimately lost. And only 3% of our missionaries and only 3% of all of our mission's dollars are being applied to that 7,000 unreached people groups, that 42% of the world, that 3.15 billion. What in the world is wrong with us? And please, no one's saying that the kid wandering around in the foyer is unimportant, but how many of us could just walk out there and say, who's your daddy, what's he wearing, let's reunite you. At least there's us to find them. But what about that kid wandering around in the central parts of China? Please understand me. I'm not saying we neglect the little kid in the foyer. I'm not saying we neglect Des Moines. I'm not saying we neglect America. I'm not saying we neglect the Christian countries of the world. I'm just saying, if 42% of the world, 3.15 billion people, 7,000 unreached people groups, if they have never ever met a Christian friend, never heard the gospel, shouldn't we at least send 42% of our funds and our missionaries there? Because this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world amongst all the unreached people groups.
And then the text says that will be done as a witness. That word witness in Greek is martos. It's where we get our word martyr. The gospel's ever gone forth under pressure. Men and women weeping, suffering to take Jesus to difficult places. One of my favorite stories that I read recently came from Rome in 258 AD. And the emperor Valerian wanted to confiscate all of the assets of the church. And so he arrested the bishop and marched him to his execution. And he walked by a young man named Lawrence. And Lawrence called out to the bishop, Sixtus the Sixth, and said, are you going to go to heaven and leave me so soon? And the bishop said to him, don't worry, my son, you'll be with me in three days. Sure enough, Lawrence was arrested and brought before the emperor. The emperor gave him three days to bring the treasures of the church. So Lawrence went and collected all the widows and the orphans, brought them back to Valerian, and he said, here, here's the treasures of the church. The emperor wasn't amused and ordered that Lawrence be roasted alive. So they lit a fire, and they chained him to a gridiron, and as in great agony, Lawrence is roasting over those flames, he looks at his persecutors, and I imagine it with a twinkle in his eye, he says to them, you can turn me over now, I'm done on this side. And then with his last breath, he prays for the people of Rome. I read a story a few months ago about a brave man in Bangladesh being tortured for his faith and he wouldn't recant. So they brought his young son in front of him and began to cut pieces off his son's body so that the father would recant his faith and he refused. Maybe you've seen the news coming out of Egypt where Coptic churches have been burnt down by radical extremists. They interviewed one widow and she went on national TV which was broadcast internationally and she said, because of the love of Jesus, I not only forgive the one who killed my husband and made my kids orphans, but I love them. Back at the studio, the announcer couldn't believe what he was watching. He put his hands on his head. He said, I don't understand these people, these Christians. As a Muslim, I would never forgive someone who killed one of my family members. These Christians are made of a different substance. These Christians, he said, are made of steel. Well, I look at that video of that brave widow and I read the story of Lawrence and the man in Bangladesh and I wonder how through the years these men and women, 70 million of them, on the day of their testing with such grace and glory, bore witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm afraid I'd squeal like a stuck pig. Or if they were cutting pieces off one of my two sons, I'd say whatever they wanted me to say, and I'd justify it, say, well, I don't mean it in my heart, I'd make it right with Jesus later, but whatever needed to be done to stop the pain for someone else, I'd probably cave in and do it. So what was it in that man from Bangladesh? And what was it in that widow from Egypt? And what was it in that Italian boy, Lawrence in Rome in 256 AD? Where did that grace come from? That on the moment of extreme agony, this beautiful witness, martyrdom towards Jesus, flowed forth. And I can only conclude that the way we die well under duress is if we have died daily discreetly. And that day after day after day after day, we have laid down our will and our selfishness and our indulgences. And we know that on that day, we're just making the last deposit of a thousand or a million little surrenders. And there is this surge of joy in our hearts because we realize our dying is about to be over and our living is about to begin. And we must reconcile ourselves to that. And how foolish it is to think that it would be the inverse, that we can live a selfish, indulgent, carnal, self-absorbed life day after day after day. And then on a moment of testing, something wonderful and magical emerged from us that we didn't deposit all those days prior. If we want to shine like the stars, if we want the glory of Jesus to emerge from us on the day of our testing, we better not start practicing that morning. There better be a legacy of living the crucified life day after day after day after day. So in that moment, Jesus can get all the glory and we can go home. And speaking of going home, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, to all the nations, as a witness, and then the end shall come.
I see there's gray hair out here, and so you'll remember this old chorus. I used to sing as a boy. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face all sorrows will erase so bravely run the race till we see christ that's why i'm a missionary i want to go home i want to see jesus i am so tired of all the junk out there but more than that i'm tired of the junk in here and in here i know what's in here i know how like a dog i go back to my old sins of pride and greed and lust and ambition and critical heart and spirit and jealousy and envy and slander and all those things. I'm just so tired of it. I know I'm redeemed. I know I'm forgiven, but I still struggle with the old flesh and the old man. And Adam, I long to be free from that. I long to go home where I'm in the presence of the, of the Lord. And I know that somewhere out there, the trumpet will sound and the sky will recede and the Lord will descend. And in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, I will be changed. I long for that. And I groan with all the creation for the liberation of the sons and daughters of men when Jesus comes back and we are changed and we are forever liberated to be in the presence of the Lord. I long for that. And yet I understand it doesn't happen according to this text until the gospel is preached in all the world to every people. Christmas is still one of our favorite holidays. Our tradition as young children was to open our presents Christmas morning. Anticipation would build, we'd sort the presents, We were so excited. We'd get up earlier before our parents and just wait for my mom and dad to come out of their bedroom so we could open those presents. And if my dad would have emerged from his bedchamber and said to my sisters and I, in the dishes of the kitchen will be washed and all the tables cleaned as a witness and then we'll open our presents, what do you think I would have done? I would have run on my little legs, grabbed my sisters by the hand, whether they wanted to wash dishes or not, and got those dishes cleaned and those tables cleared so that we could open our presents. And the great gift of eternal life, the presence of Jesus forever, no death, no sin, no curse, no night, no crying. It is out there waiting for us to open it. And all we got to do is wash the Father's dishes. All we have to do is preach the gospel of the kingdom in all the world to every unreached people group as a witness. And then the end will come. Have you forgotten that you're an alien? Have you forgotten that you're a stranger? Have you forgotten that this world is not your home? The king stands amongst us, and he doesn't stand cap in hand begging. The king gives commands, and the king has commanded his body to go into all the world and make disciples of all the unreached people groups. And then we get to go home. So what are we waiting for? So clearly, in all of the commissions of Scripture, Matthew, go make disciples of all the unreached peoples. Mark, preach the gospel to every creature. Luke, repentance, forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in my name to all the unreached peoples. John, as the Father sent me, that's the word missionary, apostles, as the Father missionized me, so I missionize you. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth, over and over, Jesus told us to go. It's the black and white of Scripture. So why are you here? And I find it troubling that if a pastor like this leaves, there's no problem filling this pulpit. There's no problem filling the job of a CEO. There's no problem filling the post of a Bible college president or, or professor. But nobody's standing in line to go to the nations. And that's what Jesus told us to do. So why are we agonizing over the going when that's what we were told to do? 
we should agonize over the stain and if God has countermanded what he put in black and white. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads? I'm going to pray in a moment, and I want to give you three ways to respond. The first I believe everyone can do, and that is to pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers to pray for unreached people groups, to pray for our missionaries in the field. At the back, in the foyer, in the middle, there's pray bands at the church. You can sign up to pray for unreached peoples. Please do that on your way out. Every one of us could pray, young or old. Some of us don't have a lot of money, but maybe we've got time, and that's our precious resource we could give. Maybe God has gifted you in wealth creation. Maybe you're good at business. Maybe you own your own company and you've been giving a little bit here and there to missions. What if you gave 42% of your business income to unreached peoples and the glory of God in all the earth? Wouldn't that be awesome? I think some of you are under-challenged. You could give a whole lot more for missions. And maybe that's your response. Maybe God's not asking you to go, but he's asking you to send and to sacrificially get behind the work of the gospel going to unreached people in a way that you never dreamed you would. And maybe God's asking you to go. There's a small group, a 1040 small group. You can sign up for it back in the foyer too for those who are feeling the call to go to unreached peoples that will train you. Maybe you're here today and God is just stirring your heart that that black and white of Scripture hasn't been rescinded for you. It hasn't been countermanded. God's telling you to go. So I don't know how the Holy Spirit is speaking, but I do feel a conviction that everyone in this room needs to respond at some level to pray, to give more than you thought possible, or to go. So I just want to pray that over you as pastor comes. Jesus, nothing in our response should be of guilt or condemnation. We just want to love you, Jesus. We want to be so in love with you and so desiring to be in your presence that we will do whatever is necessary for the king to come back, that we get to go home. We don't want to be driven by cause, we don't want to see the peoples of the world as targets to tick off a list. We want to have a love for them as pastors and we want to love the lost so that when we go home, there are brothers and sisters of every tribe, tongue, nation, language going home with us. Jesus, we love you so much. We want to go home. So let it be a joint effort. Some of us giving more than is reasonable. Some of us, maybe all of us, praying more than we've prayed before. And some from this very congregation saying, I will go to the ends of the earth and lay down my life that the king will come in glory and take us all home. Help us, Jesus, each heart to respond. Amen.